Hey guys, welcome back to New Digs. We're here in Jill's beautiful, bountiful kitchen garden and it's June. We're gonna talk about five jobs that need doing now. So let's get started. So number one is paying attention to the insects in your garden. And I think this is where your, um, your training as a master gardener really comes in handy um, because you understand the life cycles of pests, you know good and bad bugs, and you know how to treat them in a way that I don't. So I'm going to be asking you some questions as we, we start talking about kitchen garden bugs. Okay, well let's just sort of talk about the things that I think are the most common things in our area. Um, something that I never had to deal with in our old gardens, but it seems to be a problem up here. Number one, uh, Colorado potato beetle. Okay. First year I was gardening here, it, they devastated my, my potatoes because I really wasn't paying attention. I never had to worry about it before, so I let it get out of hand and it really affected my yield. But if you pay a little attention, mm -hmm. it's you can nip that problem in the bud. Now those are at oblong stripy guys? Yeah. Okay. They're so Jill, I want to ask you, these uh, leaves that are eaten, is this the damage that the potato beetle is doing? It's, it's denuding the plant of leaves so that it can't photosynthesize? Is that what's going on? Well, yes it is. It's, but let's talk about the life cycle of the bug. What happens is the beetle itself overwinters in the soil. It comes up, it lays its eggs on the back side of, of the leaf. They lay the eggs, then they turn into larvae, and then the larva does this damage. Okay. So we want to pick off the adults. We want to look at the back sides of the leaves whenever we start to see a little bit of damage. And we want to squish the, the, the eggs. The egg, if we see the eggs, the actual eggs on the back of the leaves. Right. Okay. And if you happen to see the larva. Oh. Oh, is that larva? You want to squish the larva. Was too. that larva? I want to say we're we're noticing these bugs and we just squished larva. But these plants to me look extraordinarily healthy. To me, that would not even register as as any kind of infestation. No, this amount of damage isn't going to do anything to the, your yield. It's going to be fine. I even picked that one leaf off and, and just squished the the larva right on it. That's fine. You really don't have to worry until you lose maybe 30% of your leaves. Okay. So you find you find the problems now before that happens. Got so, it. So and that's what we're doing. So this is really preventative. It's pro prophylactic. Okay. Absolutely. Um, other things that you might want to be keeping an, a lookout for this time of year is um, aphids. Ah. Aphids are only a problem if you don't kind of take care of it. And they're ubiquitous. Aphids are everywhere. And I, you notice I'm itching because... Yeah, they're on, they they're on all sorts of things. Now, um, they were on my, my apples. Um, and one of the things that tells you you have aphids is if, you're, if you've got your leaves are kind of curling up. If you see the curled leaves, you look on the back side. That's where they always hide. That's mm -hmm. always where the, yeah. the bugs hide. And, and you'll, you'll find the aphids. And all you have to do is either hit it with a, a strong hose or if you want, you can use insecticidal soap mm -hmm. if, if that's um, if the hose wasn't enough. I've heard dish soap, just a little bit of dish soap in um, like a spray bottle with water, um, also might work. Um, yes, it it, it does. It, soft, they're soft bodied, so it, it just sort of clogs them yeah. up. At my nursery yesterday, one of our jobs was actually to go through all the calabrachoa, which is like the little mini petunias, and find ones that were infested, and those we dumped, because aphids, the problem is once you have them, they do seem to spread really quickly. Well, in a nursery setting, you've Ex got to be very, very that's careful. That's right, because we don't want to sell any product that's... Damaged. In a home setting, your apple trees are already planted, you're, you know, everything's already established, so strong, right. strong hose, monitor you'll be fine. And aphids are those little green, I'm sure we have some footage of yes, them we that do. we're gonna show people. So you'll know an aphid. And they also, they, the damage they do is by sucking, right? They, they um, suck the liquid out of leaves right. and compromise them. Right, right. So just keep an, keep an eye out, you'll be fine. Okay. Um, aphids are kind of the least of our problems, right? Yeah, they really are. Um, another thing to be on the lookout for if you grow tomatoes is tomato hornworm. This is one ugly bug. 
I think he's kind of pretty, but you know, it's all in the eyes of the beholder. That's true. So <laughs> just keep a, a lookout, um, and if you see them, you pick them off. I by hand, by hand, and I will feed them to my my chickens. But if you don't happen to have chickens, you can just dump them into some soapy water. Right. If you happen to see a tomato hornworm, a big, they're, they're, they're big. They're big. They're like the dinosaurs of green worms. If you happen to see them with little white dots on their back, those little dots are, are the eggs of a parasitic wasp. Which is incredible. Which means that the wasps are doing you a favor by taking care of of killing the, yeah. the, the hornworm. So, so I leave that alone. Worm, so if, the wasp is actually laying its eggs in the body of the worm. Right. And the eggs are basically feeding off of the, the larva are feeding off of the hornworm. Nature it, is not for the, the faint of heart, it's people. Really, it's really not. It's really not. <laughs> so if I see that happening, I leave it alone. But if you see just a hornworm on its own, I will pluck it off. So either way, the hornworm is dead. Yeah. Either, so just, it's just either way, he's, he's kind of screwed. Half of gardening is just paying attention. Yeah. So. Uh, oh, one other thing um, and it, that I was going to comment on is if you, you'll see a picture of the hornworm, but I've always associated them with the caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland who smokes the hookah. Yeah. That looks like, like the epitome of cartoon yes. tomato hornworm. So yes. just putting that out there. Okay. There you go. Um, the other thing that I've noticed is a common issue in my garden is the, um, the cabbage moth. moths. So if you see those pretty little white butterflies flitting around your, your, your cabbages in particular, and when I say cabbages, I mean uh, kale, Brassica. kohlrabi, cabbages, I mean anything, that's, anything that's in the... Bra brassica, right? Yes. Anything that's a crucifer kind of... Cruciferous. Cruciferous. Um, the cabbage uh, worm or the cabbage moth, um, they're going to be interested in that. So if you start to see the little butterflies, know that you're going to have to pay attention because because they're going to lay your eggs and what's going to happen is they're going to be little tiny, tiny little green worms. I've seen And those. they're going to be starting to make holes in your, your leaves. And they're also going to um, show up in your... your kale salad by mistake when you're serving it to your guests and you don't want that to happen. <laughs> so you want to start paying attention and, and picking those off. And the same thing, you can either feed them to your chickens, you can squish them. Protein. Or, or you can... Just consider them protein. Or you can just drop them into a, a, a little, you know, I keep a coffee can out in the vegetable garden for, for doing that. Um, but if, you, if you're more on your game, you can put a floating row cover over your um, your cabbages earlier right and that will prevent the whole thing from happening I didn't get that done this year so I've got the little butterflies floating around number two on the list is cutting off the scapes off your garlic now when I say scapes I mean when the flowers start to form they form these cute little curly cue neck with a, with a flower head on the end. When they start to look like this, now's the time to be cutting them off. What you want to be doing is getting right down and cutting these off right above the leaves. Now, you don't want to throw these out. You're going to take them inside. You're going to make pesto. It's going to be great. You put them in a food processor with some lemon juice, olive oil, walnuts, and a pinch of salt. You whiz it up, and you're going to put it on pasta and make pizza, and it's going to be great. Now, the reason we want to do this is because if you don't cut the flowers off, the plant is gonna start sending energy towards, towards the flower and the flower will make seed. And it's going to be thinking, all my focus is on, on making seed rather than making a bulb. And with garlic, the whole thing is the bulb. That's what your, your harvest is. So we're not interested in making seeds, so 
Basically, it's just deadheading. It's okay. Number three, thinning. So if you've uh, sown seed in your garden, direct seeded, um, chances are there's going to be a, some places where you've sown a little too thickly and plants are going to start to crowd each other out. I I tend to like to not waste my, my thinnings, so sometimes I wait a little too long so I can actually like harvest little baby vegetables. So for instance, here are some carrots and you really ideally want them to be spaced out a couple of inches, but I've got some that are just cheek by jowl in here, so I'm going to thin out some of the babies. And you don't need to throw these out, you can, you can eat them, they're, they're delicious. Let's see. And now the rest of them will have a little extra room to develop to the full size. And some plants like kohlrabi, if you thin them, thin them now, the leaves are very tender and you can eat the actual leaves like you would kale. They taste just like kale. So that doesn't get wasted either. Now, if you don't want to disturb the roots of the plants next to you, you can just trim off the tops of the, the unwanted plants. Um, and that's, that's a t totally legitimate way to do it. But, um, I like to do this and uh, it seems to work pretty well, so thin your vegetables. So tip number four is weeding. And frankly, the biggest problem that we're having with this segment is finding weeds in Jill's garden. This will not be a problem in my garden. We literally just spent about four minutes looking with a magnifying glass to find weeds. There are Not weeds here, but we have we have located a couple. <laughs> so I've got a certain amount of uh, clover in here, but you know, <laughs> but the point is, if you keep up with weeding, it never becomes a this big is chore. True. I keep a bucket, just a, a nursery pot, in my vegetable garden. For that purpose it just sits in the corner and when i see a weed i pull it and it never becomes a big issue i never say i've got to go out and weed because it's just something that i kind of keep up with i can't really say the same thing for my flower garden but but in the vegetable garden i do pretty much keep up with it but it's just easy enough to to pull a weed toss it in the in the the bucket that you have right there and yeah, and the biggest thing with weeds too is you really you don't want them to flower. Isn't there some some saying about that that if you I can't remember this. There's I some think, saying I think it's about one that. one year of, of weed equals five years of seed. Yeah. So so when they once they go to flower, what one of weeds' primary superpowers is that they they're very prolific and they can seed themselves in in crevices and places you would never expect. And so if you don't get them before they flower, you're gonna have you know, exponentially more the next year. So that's why it's such a good practice, especially in the vegetable garden. Well, uh, I've to, had to, to be keep weeds under control. I've had to be on top of it this year because I have to admit that I, I put in some um, dubious compost this year, and I have a, a lot of a new weed I've never had before. Uh, so I um, am trying to keep on top of it this year because I've got. 10 million of these tiny little things I've never seen before. Uh, so, um, And when you say dubious compost, do you mean compost that hasn't broken down fully so the weed seeds were not I, killed? I have to admit that I picked up um, a lot of compost from the Norfolk um, a lot of people do. transfer the station. Free, that looked, free it looked like beautiful stuff, but um, it, it obviously it didn't, yeah. hadn't burned off all the weed seeds. It hadn't heated up properly. Right, and well, believe me, we'll talk about compost. It's one of our favorite subjects. Yes, in another video. Yes, but um, keep on top of weeds. So that's number four. Perfect. And 
Number five is feeding. Now feeding is something you're going to have to do every week or two in the vegetable garden and some things are heavier feeders than others. Garlic is a heavy feeder and I clearly have not been keeping up with, with that enough because I am starting to get some brown tips um, and some, some brown on the lower leaves and it's not, gonna, it's not the end of the world but it's an indication that it is robbing the top of the plant in order to keep feeding the, the bulbs. So um, I'm going to be fish emulsioning this later today, um, but generally during the month of June, you're gonna be wanting to, to feed every week or two. And every week for something that, like a, a garlic, um, other things that are heavy feeders are pumpkins um, and melons. So you're gonna wanna keep up on your feeding for a healthy, abundant crop. Thanks for joining us today in Jill's practically weed-free kitchen garden. <laughs> and we'll see you next time on New Digs.